Good morning. Welcome to the March 14th, 2024 Mobility Working Group meeting. My name is Council Member Jose Rodriguez from National City, and uh, we'll be chairing the meeting today. I would like to ask our interpreter to introduce themselves and go over the processes and procedures before we start our meeting. Yes, good morning. To use the interpretation feature, please scroll to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are, click on the interpretation icon, the world, and select English as your language. If you're joining through the Zoom mobile app from a cell phone, tablet, etc., please press the ellipsis, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Finally, click on mute original audio to not hear the original Spanish low in the background. Headsets are available for interpretation. If you're in the meeting room, please check out a headset from the receptionist in the lobby. Buenos días. Para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, por favor, desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom donde aparecen los controles. Uh, clic en el icono de interpretación donde está el globo terráqueo y selección español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom desde su celular, tableta, etc., presione los puntos suspensivos, luego interpretación y luego el idioma. Si no desea escuchar el audio original en inglés en el fondo, por favor seleccione silenciar audio original. Contamos con auriculares disponibles para el servicio de interpretación. Si se encuentra en la sala de, de reunión, favor de pedir auriculares con la recepcionista en el vestíbulo. Thank you. Thank you so much. And before we begin, can we ask uh, Tessa, who's serving as our clerk today, to confirm if we have quorum? Thank you, Chair. We do have a quorum with 16 of 23 jurisdictions present. Thank you so much. And before we begin, uh, I would like to review the meeting process for working group members as well as the public. For working group members, if, we, if you wish to speak, simply raise your hand. For any members of the public, I believe there needs to be a speaker slip filled out. Um, and Tessa is here as well. So um, moving on to item number one, we do have some Sandag updates. Uh, Josh Clark will be providing an update on some upcoming uh, bike events, as well as Kalisa will provide an update on Bike Anywhere Day. All right, good morning. My name is Kalisa Bowling, and I'm on the mobility team here at Sandag. Uh, so I wanted to invite you all to this year's Bike Anywhere Day, uh, which will be happening Thursday, May 16th. So I want to make sure everyone gets out their pins and writes that down. Um, Signups will begin tomorrow. That's uh, Friday, March 15th. So you can go to sandag.org slash bike month to sign up. And we plan to have over 100 pit stops throughout the region. Uh, this year, the pit stops will be open from 7 to 10 instead of 6 to 9. Um, so we're in try trying to encourage everyone to bike, whether they're going to work, to school, or maybe the beach or the park. Uh, in addition to signing up to join us, we also encourage you to consider signing up to host a pit stop. I know uh, many of the jurisdictions did last year, um, but we hope that you'll consider hosting a pit stop this year. The pit stop applications will also open up tomorrow at sandag.org slash bike month. Uh, so we look forward to your participation this year, and there'll be more information coming. We'll also be notifying the board about this tomorrow. So please mark your calendars for this exciting day. Thank you. Hey y'all, uh, Kalisa teed this up nicely. I'm Josh Clark. I'm uh, an actual transportation planner in the engineering and construction division here. So in, in anticipation of bike month, we'll again be reaching out to you all for updates to the existing bikeways to capture on the Seneca regional bike map. Uh, we've got good staff contacts that we'll start with from last year, but if you can ensure your teams know this is coming, we'll appreciate it. We're gonna reach out by the end of the month and hope to get it all dialed in in April. Uh, for again for May. And then uh, the second announcement is that the statewide Cal Bike Summit is back in San Diego for the first time in a decade. It's going to be April 18th and 19th. That's a Thursday and Friday, just down the street from here uh, at the Wyndham San Diego Bayside. And you may have already seen some of this, uh, but uh, there are over 30, 30 topics, 30 panels, sorry, on topics from Bike Share Division Zero covering all the E's. And uh, it, there's also two rides scheduled. So technical tours of some recently completed Sandag and City of San Diego projects, as well as some in-progress projects. Um, so the single day tickets are $240. And the two day is 470 but there's a group discount for a purchase of four or more, and that's $420. Cool. Thanks. Thank you all so much for the updates. Uh, do we have any comments from the members of the public? Thank you. I have one public commenter on non-agenda. And just so we can ensure that we have time to 
um, conduct all the business of the meeting. The public comments will be one minute per. Um, please go ahead, the original draw. Of course, it's one minute because then, you know, you really want to hear from the public if I'm the only one. It's kind of funny. Um, but yeah, as we talk about mobility um, and the human trafficking that is actually going on in our communities through the transit centers and um, hotels that are going on, um, you know, we are engaging in trafficking of the children. And this is something that we should be paying attention to. Um, and, um, you know, because we're facilitating it and paying for it. And until we still um, do something about it, you know, these children are being trafficked and sold off and different things. And, and that's it. Um, yes. So, or you can still listen to what I'm saying to MTS. So yeah, what you guys are doing with um, the influx in um, your or increase in the budget um, for um, this um, 2024 operating budget, you know, with the um, illegals that are being dropped off at the transit when I had spoke. And your time expired and that concludes the public comments on this item. Thank you. Do we have any working member comments? Yes, uh, Mr. May. I just a uh, question uh, for staff. I, I know Sandag used to produce a state of the commute report on an annual basis. I think last time I saw one it was probably a year ago. And that one, but because the meeting was canceled and was I never saw it again. So I wonder if are we getting one anytime soon? Yes, we are getting one right, and it is in the works now. So, you know, once it's it's in draft form and ready to go, we can ask Grace Mino from our staff to come back and give a presentation of it. But there will be a, a state of the commute report this year. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional working member uh, comments? Um, Chair, yes. just, just to clarify on the state of the uh, commute or the... Um, is that for the last year, the last calendar year, or this year, or what? what's the report? I believe it's from the last calendar year, yeah, because you, you need all the data. Yeah. yeah. And and when that item comes up, I'll share with you our uh, city state of the commute, which I think is fairly representative of some of the outlying cities, like up in North County and probably East County. Thanks. Thank you. All right, moving on to consent, item number two. Um, do we have any comments from the members of the public? There are no public comments. Any questions or comments from committee members? I will entertain a motion to approve item number two, which is the uh, last meeting minutes. I'll make that motion to move that forward. Thank you, Councilmember uh, Seabury from Imperial Beach. Do I have a second? Most time, City of Solano Beach, second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Uh, everybody in favor, raise your hand. Anybody opposed? Any abstentions? All right, motion passes. Thank you. Moving on to item number three. We will now hear from our very own Jennifer Williamson and Susan Huntington, Sandag Director of Financial Planning, Budgets, and Grants. And we'll introduce the 2024 Mobility Working Group Work Plan before opening up the floor for member discussions. Great. So actually, uh, Susan will not be joining us today. She was the uh, here for the budget, and that budget item will actually go directly to the PACs and Board of Directors. There wasn't time to bring that forward at, at this time. So um, with the work plan, though, as you requested at several of your previous meetings, you requested that we bring back the work plan for a group discussion. And before we jump into that, and if we jump into that, I want to share with you a little bit of what happened at our board of directors retreat this past week where your leadership came. And there was a lot of discussion about our working groups and the role of the working groups. And what we heard from our leadership is that they would like our working groups to become much more strategic and much more um, detailed in terms of, of the different items. So we wouldn't just bring you information items. We would try to get you really into the details of our items so that you're able to inform your leadership better 
and prepare them better for the meetings. All of that being said, there was a recommendation that we have the working groups come together. There's, I believe there's three working groups um, that would need to come together and have a formal workshop to talk about what the role of the working groups are and how to make them more strategic. That uh, workshop is, is being calendared right now. It looks like it'll happen at the beginning of May. So what we're recommending that is instead of going through this work plan, which was kind of a draft of an update of where we, what the last work plan was, is that we wait for that actual workshop to happen. And it would be, um, there would be a mediator. It would be a very intensive kind of morning to bring you guys together to figure out how to get these working groups to a place that the leadership feels like they're getting what they need out of them. So with that, I'm proposing that we go ahead and table this item today and wait until that workshop item happened or that workshop happens and then bring this back in May. So I, I'd like to hear any comments or Mo. Thank you, Jennifer. I actually was going to recommend that, but I certainly appreciate your recommendation. I personally agree with that um, wholeheartedly. Uh, my comment and question, and perhaps a request is, I like the idea of a joint workshop, but I am somewhat concerned that our goals and mission, I'm talking about this mobility group's goals and mission, which most likely is in line with other working groups, to be honest, I am not familiar with their goals and missions, but looking at the regional issues, I'm, I'm confident that we are the same. However, we tackle, um, different types of uh, mobility related concerns, as you can imagine from the from the complexion of this, this group, mostly engineering, public works issues as compared to other professionals. I am wondering if it might be beneficial to have our own short workshop first, and then when we meet with them, at least we will be more prepared to collaborate with them and pick and choose those items that are more, um, uh, connected with, with with our goals. This is just a thought process. I'm um, willing to hear from from my other colleagues and perhaps your your opinion. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mo. I appreciate those comments, and I and I share those comments. and And thank you for the suggestion. I do support that. Um, with Mo's comments, um, I think it would be helpful to actually have a discussion with this mobility working group. I, I have the pleasure to be the staff liaison for um, not just SANDAG, but also our transit authority, so NCTD. Um, and we're the staff, uh, most of us who are public works, in the public works fields, we're the, we're the staff who is most knowledgeable. We're staff experts on mobility and transportation related matters. And that's a big portion of what SANDAG does and what our regional plan consists of. Um, so it's really, as you know, because you're doing all the modeling and, and preparing all the programs, it's super complex. And a lot of the complexities get lost in uh, with layperson reviewing the program. Uh, so uh, I know your board members do lean on us to provide our thoughts and, and recommendations. So I really do support Mo's comments. Just wanted to add a few other comments. Um, I think we all support the overriding goals of SANDAG and all of our cities, I believe, with our general plans and our mobility elements, and that's to move people and goods uh, safely, quickly, cleanly, and fairly. And so there's a lot of ways that you could do that, which you're including in your, your uh, SANDAG models for, for developing these programs. Um, what we've been hearing in our uh, subcommittee meetings and, and when I'm, we have city engineers meetings and public works meetings like AS or APWA, and it's super difficult for us, including SANDAG, to deliver projects. There's so many steps involved with the environmental regulations, all the stakeholders. The public really deserves to be a part of the process, and we value their input early on. So that being said, it takes forever to get pro public works projects completed. Uh, with that said, what we're looking for as uh, your partners is as much flexibility as possible in um, when we're using transnet dollars that are designated to the cities. 
Um, and with that, um, I, I also had the pleasure to meet with you and, and some of uh, Sandag's other staff who are working on the regional plan and specifically the planning effort. Um, if we could, uh, maybe you'll talk to this later, but um, have some sort of an educational forum on the modeling involved because it's so complex. And we all struggle with the new transportation model for VM, uh, VMT, I always have to say it out, like vehicle miles traveled. And there's a lot of problems with that, right? It's like, it's subjective. And, and so I've heard board members say, what are, what are we really trying to do? Well, we're trying to reduce greenhouse gases. We're try, trying to also move people and goods very efficiently and safely. So I'd like to also take on, and this is a lower priority because we've got a lot on our plate, but um, suggestions on how we could look at legislative changes to improve uh, the transportation modeling. Because if you think of moving people and, and I've heard board members say like, it, it, maybe we should look at moving people hourly. And I'd say even look at moving people hourly per carbon unit, if you wanna look at the sustainable uh, issue, right? We're trying to move people efficiently and cleanly and safely and fairly. So um, I'd like to look at suggested changes to state law on how we can improve and meet our goals better. Because we, we've seen these diagrams on how you can move people efficiently. And we've seen like the bus with 60 seats. And then you've seen like, of course, the car further down, that's not as efficient. But what we're seeing is, is like a lot of not filled buses and, and they're still burning hydrocarbons. And then we're seeing cars like the car I drove down, which is electric and we carpool. So when you look at it relative to who's moving what more efficiently, there, that's, there's a lot in there, right? So I, I'd say that a, a car full of passengers that's electric using one of Sandag's amazing managed lanes is much more efficient and better for the earth than a, a bus with a few people in it that's still burning hydrocarbons and it's super heavy. It's wearing out our streets and it's taking a lot of space. And, and a lot of times they're, they're not carrying any passengers and then that's more BMT. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement in actually how we're currently modeling transportation planning. And, and uh, I look forward to those conversations and I really appreciate everything Sandeg's doing. Any additional comments or questions? I, I would like to um, say that uh, although I wasn't at the entire board meeting, I attended mo a board retreat, I attended most of it. I think the consensus among the board members, um, which are your member city members, um, was to have these joint um, uh, working group sessions in order to better collaborate with different working groups. We're faced with a ton of issues ourselves as a uh, working group, so are others. And oftentimes it feels like individuals are working in silos and we wanna have kind of a more comprehensive uh, vision working together. So um, if I'm just paraphrasing what occurred last week, which most of your board members stated that they wanted, that's the direction that that um, was provided to us, right? Uh, and to Sandag staff, which is why this was the recommendation. Not to say that a lot of the issues that you bring up are very real. And um, so we need to work on them as well, but, um, um, it, it, for me, it made sense that the overwhelming majority wanted to actually have these collective joint working groups in order to address a host of regional issues that we seem to be kind of siloed in. Um, uh, I, I do, uh, I did speak to a colleague and mention how housing is in its own bubble, mm -hmm. transit is in its own bubble, trans transportation is in its own bubble, um, shoreline preservation is in its own bubble. So I think having that big collaborative conversation was the spirit of the meeting that took place last week. Um, that's why Sandag is making that. But that's not to minimize any of the issues that you bring up, which are very real and are going to be addressed at this specific working group um, going forward. Um, thank you, Chair. Just to follow on question it might be for staff is um, regarding which working groups would be included. Were those the three? Um, I would guess it's, of course, ours and sustainable com communities, which I think are the community development directors, planning directors, right. and then would the other be the equity or, or the, what would the, uh, the third one be? I might have misspoken. I, there might be four. So there would be yeah. military and equity. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.
Good morning. Sorry, I was uh, stepping out. So Alyssa Muto with the City of San Diego. Um, I've had a chance to look through the work plan. I think it's great to see the highlight of the flexible fleets. Um, I think recognizing that um, every trip is a discrete uh, trip or or including the destination, how you get there, having more mobility options is should be a priority in our work plan and, and how we achieve that. Um, some of the things that I would love to see more of from SANDAG staff is um, those comprehensive procurements. That has been a really fantastic tool for the city of San Diego. And I think um, as we share more about how we've been able to piggyback off of the work that SANDAG staff has done on procurements to try out and pilot or implement new programs in our cities, I think that's what's going to make um, it feasible for our region to accommodate new sustainable modes of transportation in those individual trips. Um, and then also um, prioritizing equity. So I don't see a lot here in our work plan around equity. And I think, um, you know, to Mr. Frank's point, it's hard to see a bus that is barely filled, but that might be the only way that person has to get to their job or to get to where they need to go. So how do we look at the populations that have a high transportation cost burden and how do we provide for them? So I really wanna maybe dig into that more on the transportation cost burden and where those populations occur in the region and how do we address those with different mobility options? Thank you. I just wanted oh. to say that. Uh, so one of the things that I really kind of have seen over the years is sort of like this disconnect between the, you know, the, the regional planning process and the projects in the ground that get implemented. And and I, I although we have a cl you know clear blueprint in the regional plan, but it, that's not what seems to transpire on the ground. And that's really where I think this kind of joint. Um, working group, uh, you know, workshops where we really get to hands on, you know, what are the transit agencies are doing for it? Because we hear of, um, you know, plans from our transit agencies that they want to implement certain things, but then you look in the regional plan and that's not what the plan calls for. So it just doesn't seem like, you know, we we're all like on the same page where I think we should, maybe there should be like a second step behind or beyond the regional plan where, okay, what is getting implemented? in the region on an agency by agency basis. And I think that's that's something I would like to see. Hopefully we can talk about. And just for clarification, um, I have I do have comments on the, the work, the draft that was um, in the agenda, but I'm, uh, you're, you're saying to hold off on those comments for now until we agendize this in May, correct? Yeah, I mean, it is agendized today, so it's reasonable if you want to discuss it. I'm just thinking if there are structural changes that happen as a result of the workshop, okay. that it may be worthwhile to wait and make those changes to the work plan later. Okay. Um, I do have some just high-level suggestions, and uh, in in addition to what I had said earlier, just with, in regards to, if, if you want to hear the high level, like you said, it's agendized today. Um, we could. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, regarding even the, the work order uh, or the order of the work plan, I think what would be really helpful is to uh, first off, look at what's what are the trends, like you're bringing to us the, the state of the commute. So um, we could have that discussion and see, you know, what are the programs that are being offered? What's working? What's not? Where are the safety concerns? A lot of us have the uh, local road safety plans and we, we have developed heat maps on where the collisions are. And uh, we know where the, the congestion points are, which then lead to greenhouse gases. So it'd be good to get an overview of, of the trends of the state of the commute and really dive into the different programs to see what's working, what's not. Um, I was so impressed with the workshop, which you prepared at the beginning of the 2021 work plan where you had the experts come in. And uh, I remember specifically Bob Poole made a comment where you know, everybody is just saying, what's going to happen with the pandemic? And what we did realize is there were significant changes as a result of the pandemic. Um, by far, the, the largest thing which we're utilizing now is, is flexible work schedules and telecommuting. That has an RTDM program, like 26% of the, 
of, of the TDM is from telecommuting. And then secondly, carpooling and other types of public transit pooling has skyrocketed. Um, active transportation has skyrocketed. Um, other uh, modes aren't doing that well. So it's really, there's been transformational shifts and it would be really good to get a handle on what's not working, what's working and what direction should we be um, going in. Um, secondly, with this group in particular, there's a lot of, like I said, public works directors, city engineers and mobility professionals were really interested in the local streets and, and uh, roads program because that's how we fund a lot of our mobility improvements. So I would like to put that at the top of the list right below, looking at the, the trends and, um, and then just some reordering, but I'll hold off on those other uh, reordering suggestions till a later meeting, but yeah, thank you. Additional comments or questions? Stay tuned for May and we'll have that workshop and come back with the work plan then. Thank you. Do we have a date for the workshop by the way? We don't, we don't. We're just getting started on trying to wrangle that, so. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, this was only a discussion item, so moving on to item number Chair, we need to take public comments on item three. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Do we have any member, sorry, any um, public comments on it? I do have one public comment, the original draw. Please go ahead. Sorry, hold on. Go ahead. I actually wanted to speak on the minutes too, and you went through it so fast. It's like, I, I know that you don't want to hear from me, but I mean, you should be paying attention so that when other people do attend, if they ever do, that you can, um, you know, take their comments. But, you know, listening to you guys talk about all of these changes that are coming, um, I don't think you quite understand. And, and it's interesting that you don't look at it in a way of it's being, you know, enslaving the people into a new way of living and um, keeping them in densely populated areas. It's a UN agenda. It's a United Nations agenda 21, 2030, 2050. It's not just a conspiracy. That's actually something it's, there's a book you can get and read about what it is. And it's about controlling the people. It's not about giving them more freedoms. And so as you would think that, you know, putting us in electric vehicles to reduce vehicle miles traveled is going to help, you have to understand that at Sandag, even the board will talk about um, that that's not even something that we can do. We still have to get people out of their car. So you can't just put everybody in an electric vehicle and think that that's going to help, especially when you need oil and gas to produce these measures. Your time expired. That concludes the public comments. Thank you so much. Moving on to item number four, we will now hear an update on regional safety up, uh, updates by Sandag's regional planners, Sam Sanford and Jacqueline Sisk. Good morning, Chair and working group members. So my name is Sam Sanford and I'm joined today with my colleague Jacqueline Sisk. We are both planners within Sandag's regional planning team, and we focus on transportation safety. Super excited to be back in front of this group after several months, I think it's September was the last time we were here providing an update specifically on the Vision Zero Action Plan. And at that last meeting, uh, we heard feedback as we started presenting, that was the kickoff meeting, and we talked about what a regional Vision Zero Action Plan can entail and what that scope could include. And we heard a lot of good feedback from this group and also a recommendation that many uh, representation representatives from local agencies wanted to be more involved in the process. So I actually took that feedback to heart and set up a local agency project development team and set up essentially these sub-regional groups and been meeting with many of you in these meetings as we go through this plan. So really appreciate the feedback. I wanna give updates today on this effort as well, and also get feedback from this group. So with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jacqueline, to start us off. Good morning, thank you. My name is Jacqueline Sisk, and I'm a regional planner here at Sandag, assisting with the Regional Vision Zero Action Plan. Um, so let's get into the Regional Vision Zero Action Plan um, with the background. Thank you. A little reminder, um, this plan is a combination of projects, policies, and programs. It's aimed to equip local jurisdictions um, to advance their safety across the region. 
some jurisdictions are doing a great job and already have a Vision Zero Action Plan set in place and are already leading this effort. Other jurisdictions have not, and this effort is designed to help them identify locations and safety solutions or other safety projects. They can then apply for the federal funding to advance their programming efforts. Three years ago, the U.S. Department of Transportation announced a new funding source called Safe Streets and Roads for All. This funding source is a billion dollars a year, at least for five years. It supports planning efforts like this one, and Sandag was fortunate to be joined in a successful application with the City of Vista and the La Jolla Band of Luceno Indians. They are currently creating their own local level plans. In addition to planning funds, Safe Streets and Roads for All grant program also includes implementation funds, but there are significant requirements to qualifying for these implementation funds. Proposed projects must be included in a qualifying plan and has to meet certain elements. This regional Vision Zero Action Plan um, is meant to serve as that document. Once the plan is complete, local jurisdictions can point to this plan and say that their project is located in the plan and therefore it qualifies for implementation dollars under the US DOT Safe Streets and Roads for All grant. The updates that we have for you today really get into the outreach and engagement and data analysis that our consultants have begun. Our team has had ongoing public engagement and outreach efforts. Sandag has been doing a series of events throughout the region. In addition to Sandag-led events, staff has also contracted with community-based organizations um, so that they can get involved with their service areas with these similar efforts. We worked with CBOs and the consultant team to create an engaging pop-up toolkit, which the public can provide their input and preferences on safer options of how they would like to move around San Diego. The public is able to contribute their feedback with these stickers, and it's a nice tactile way for them to get involved, and the kids really love the stickers as well. This is a great way to get feedback from the communities and also serves as an educational opportunity as well. In the winter, we wrapped up a digital engagement effort on Sandag Safer Streets website. There was an interactive map where the public was able to draw pins and comment on their safety concerns um, that they may have and the gaps within the network. It was a successful tool and we nearly reached 3,000 comments and currently we're analyzing all of that information. In addition to Sandag and CBO outreach events, we have had quarterly technical advisory group meetings with various um, interdisciplinary backgrounds. And we've also hosted our local agency PDT meetings, um, which is the project development teams that Sam mentioned earlier. And we have met with the North, South, West and East regions. Um, throughout the jurisdictions, and we've talked on a more detailed level on um, efforts for this plan. Uh, we have had two rounds of local project development team meetings, and we are going to host our third round next week. Uh, we have continuous engagements in our working group meetings, and our second we're currently going on our second round of working group meetings. We will be going to our policy advisory committees as well, and ultimately wrapping up the details of the plan. One of the major projects being developed in the Regional Vision Zero Action Plan is the benchmark assessment and action items. This benchmark assessment is a nationwide standard for model safety programs. The consultant team has reviewed Sandag's existing safety policies, programs, and projects and, evalu and evaluated them against these elements listed on the screen um, with the addition of Safe Systems Network. The evaluation determined what existing strategies are most effective to reduce um, severe crashes and where there are gaps existing in the regional safety program. 
From this benchmark, uh, the consultant team developed a prioritized list of action items for inclusion of the Vision Zero Action Plan for Sandag to implement to further support the regional, uh, regional safety efforts. And with that, I am going to now pass it off to my colleague, Sam Sanford, so that he can jump into the data elements. Thank you, Jacqueline. All right, jumping right into the data. And again, some of this will look familiar to many of you working or serving on the local agency product development team meetings. So as a reminder that the Vision Zero Action Plan, this visional, regional approach is looking at safety kind of in two different lenses in parallel. One is looking at crash history and is a little bit reactive, identifying locations that have concentrations of crashes over time. The other is more proactive, identifying risk factors or looking at a, a risk-based analysis or systemic safety to identify those kind of features and attributes that as they uh, start to accumulate in one location, increase chances of, of crashes in the future. This illustration that we're looking at right now is kind of a first, uh, it's a draft at this point, but it's bringing both of those together and gives us insights into some of those data. What we're looking at on here is the historic crash data and attributes from roadway features and surrounding features and what we're seeing for the San Diego region. And not to go through every little text bubble on here, but if I start with just kind of in the center here at the pedestrian uh, text box there. So pedestrians are involved in only 7% of crashes in our region, but they account for 23% of fatal or serious injury crashes. And so this gets into the vulnerable user that we know, we've known for a long time, and that this is consistent with national trends, that vulnerable users are disproportionately included or involved in fatal and serious injury crashes. But now we're seeing what that really means for our region specifically. Moving left from there, 63% of pedestrian fatal and serious injury crashes happen in poor lighting conditions. So now we're bringing, bringing in attribute information about the surrounding context. Okay, so poor lighting is a factor. It's not just the mode, it's also features within the roadways. If I move uh, towards the bottom right, 49% of fatal and serious injury crashes occur on roads with four or more lanes. So again, bringing in roadway features to understand where should we be looking at uh, investing finite dollars? So this is just a summation of what we're seeing right now. And if I didn't mention it already, I should note that this is specifically to, or it excludes uh, freeways. So any access restricted facility uh, is excluded from this. So getting more into the kind of reactive approach, looking at crash histories and where we've had concentrations of crashes throughout the network in our region. We're developing this draft safety focus network. And what this is, it's a way of quickly taking what we have as over 10,000 miles of roadways in our region, which is too large to figure out where to even start when it comes to the the goal of Vision Zero is to get to zero fatalities and serious injuries. We have 10,000 miles, where do you begin? So a, a first step in many Vision Zero action plans is developing a network like this, the safety focus network, where we look for those concentrations of fatal and serious injury crashes, and we're able to do that. And we found that 54% of fatal and serious injury crashes occur on just 6% of our network. So 6% of our roadways account for 54% of fatal and serious injury crashes. So that, just from this one work product, we're able to quickly whittle down over 10,000 miles to approximately 600 miles, which is a, a big leap forward understanding where we should focus the finite resources we really have to address safety, traffic safety. Within that network, 59% of those fatal and serious injury crashes, you'll see the term KSI on there, it's fatal and serious injury crashes, 59% of those involving a pedestrian. 54% of fatal and serious injury crashes involving a cyclist are included on that network. And 49% of crashes involving youth and senior are included in that network. So what does that network actually look like for our region? So, the exact stats are here on the left-hand side of the slide, so it comes into 653 miles is the safety focus network at this for the draft. It'll become final once the, the plan is, is finalized. 
And you'll see that the network is spread throughout the entire county. There are concentrations on the urbanized kind of western portion, but it goes out to East County. It includes roadways in and around tribal areas, uh, more rural communities as well. And the way this was accomplished is the consultant team looked by mode. So they looked at concentrations of fatal and serious and uh, other visible injury crashes for bicyclists, pedestrians, motorcyclists, and then fatal and serious injury crashes for motor vehicles. They looked at those separately. And they also looked separately at census-defined urbanized areas and essentially non-urbanized areas because the traffic patterns, volumes, crash types are very distinct between those two different areas. So essentially they did this eight different ways, urban and rural, and then between four modes. So I'll take you through the four different modes. You can kind of see the distinction between them, starting here with the pedestrian mode. And you'll see that in this yellow orange color. And there's more on the Western portion of the, of the county. And then in the more cities, more urbanized sections of, of cities as well. This is where you'll see the concentrations for pedestrian. Then we'll bring in the cyclist or our bicycle safety focus network. And now we see it's spread out a little bit more, but definitely along the Western coast, there's quite a bit, and then additional concentration in cities. Motorcycle is spread throughout the entire county, but we start to see more lines appear in Eastern County. And lastly, motor vehicle. And again, this one is spread throughout the entire county. So the, the first map that I showed the, with the black lines for the safety focus network, that is essentially a compilation of these four. So there are some segments of the safety focus network that were identified for pedestrians and cyclists and motor vehicles and motorcycles. So they can add up and there could be multiple modes within each of those, but those come down to that last uh, composite review of, of the network. But 653 miles is still too large to just take on. We need to further prioritize that. So for that piece, we have uh, two prioritization processes. We'll focus first on the one on the left with the, um, again, this is historic, looking at where past concentrations were in the past. And then we'll also look at the systemic risk factors, that risk-based approach for being proactive. So on the safety focus network, we have the input on the left-hand side of the slide is that network. Just if, if a portion is on the network, it's included. Then we look at land use again, urban and rural. And then we bring in this, these three key boxes in green in the center. So we bring in social equity, trip activity, and then modal coverage. For social equity, we are using a, a tool that U.S. Department of Transportation has released called the Equitable Transportation Communities, or ETC for short. And that has over 40 metrics uh, nationwide. It's updated regularly. It's a tool that's not required for safe streets and roads for all, but it's highly encouraged. And so that was part of the reason for going for it. And also that it's updated very regularly. That's also supplemented with Census Bureau data for the social equity piece. For trip activity, we brought in data for population density, uh, employment, and then also to capture recreational trips, uh, trips of, of leisure as well in that one. And then modal coverage, this brings in the four modes of the safety focus network. So again, capturing those segments that are on all four modes were brought in. From that, we'll get a prioritized list. We'll be able to bring in and get in input from the community feedback that Jacqueline spoke to, getting input from local agencies as well, and ultimately getting a, a prioritized list of projects from that. A very similar slide, it will be the process for the systemic risk factors. The input for this one, however, will be those systemic risk factors, those uh, elements that are known to correlate highly with fatal and serious injury crashes. Bringing the same social equity and trip activity pieces in green, and then the last part will actually be where those um, risk factors start piling up. So 
if a, a segment has one risk factor, okay, that's something to note. But if it has five or six risk factors, okay, that's a higher priority. And so that will be elevated in this process. Other tools that are being developed as part of this plan and, and still kind of in the development phase are this idea of a safety solutions toolbox, or essentially a tool for practitioners that they can use once this plan is finalized and they have projects or they have segments on this on either of these networks or both of these networks, they can come in and they can see, okay, what should we do in this location? And so the idea behind this toolbox, there will be a series of recommendations of for this segment, you have this type of uh, crashes or crash history, these types of risk factors, here are countermeasures that can work. But then live, giving jurisdictions the information they need to make tough decisions about how to move forward, but not saying exactly how to move forward because the jurisdictions are gonna understand best uh, the context of that segment. As far as next steps, you know, data analysis is really wrapping up uh, and we are working more on the systemic safety side through the spring. The toolbox is uh, underway right now and uh, being formed. We're looking at wrapping up that vision zero, essentially the plan itself, this uh, say June, July timeframe and stakeholder outreach is going ongoing. There's gonna be a few more safety elements that continue post completion of the Vision Zero Action Plan. We wanna further support AB 43 and other state uh, elements that jurisdictions have communicated that we can continue to support in those, in those realms. And I do wanna to speak to already some actions that are gaining traction with the Safety Focus Network, the Childhood Obesity Initiative, which is the County of San Diego working with UCSD, and their collaborators, they've already started working on, uh, they've identified uh, the schools along the safety focus network, and they're doing walking audits with all their collaborator, collaborators to pull in information about what's happening in those school zones that are on or in the safety focus network, and then compiling all that information. So this is already bearing fruit and already being used. And so we're really excited to continue working on this. And that concludes our report and how to take any comments or questions. Thank you so much. Uh, very informative, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the members of the public? All right. Yes, uh, we do have one public comment, the original draw, please go ahead. Yeah, I think, you know, I mean, obviously we don't want people to, you know, get in crashes and die and, and all of those things. But what we don't acknowledge is all of the infrastructure and the technology that you want to bring forward for your zero emissions is actually putting people in danger. So not only are they lithium bombs, um, these lithium batteries, you know, are combustible just from the fumes and they can't be put out. We don't even have any mechanism to put out a ton of fires. I mean, let alone one just combusting a vehicle like that or a bus. I mean, that is severely, um, you know, uh, putting people at risk because we don't have, you know, you can't use it takes tens of gallons of um, thousands of gallons of water in order to, um, you know, put it out. And then just the radiation that comes off of this technology and the charging stations, let alone just even being in a vehicle that has that. Um, so, I mean, we need to be acknowledging these things because you are putting people at risk. They are being microwaved from the inside out when we use this kind of uh, technology. That concludes the public comments. Thank you. Do we have any committee member comments or questions? Yes. Um, thank you so much for this report and the detailed work, um, the data-driven analysis that you've done and being mindful of our residents um, that are, um, whose lives have been impacted um, directly by vehicle safety issues. Um, as I think about how do we use this as cities moving from here, I think that actually equating what is done by Sandag staff into our cities is a really big piece of the puzzle that we have to be thinking about more. So um, I have one question, but let me jump to my second point and then I'll come back to the other question is, I would love to see 
SANDAG take on similar to the EAP bike program, a Vision Zero program that sets up to go after grants, to provide funding, to come in and do projects in our city that are regionally important from a multimodal safety issue. Um, so I saw, I, it, what would I think also be helpful is to see heat mapping of where all four of those factors come together into the same intersection or corridor. Um, also high resource areas, um, because that can get funding now more in the state of California over you know, TPAs and high resource areas. Um, I just think a program like that would be helpful. Also having maybe a bench of consultants that can do work for design and or build of those vision zero improvements, both the traditional and the creative, maybe there's roadway closures to prioritize active transportation in a corridor um, because it's just not working to have all the modes together. Um, so my, my one question is when you, and I saw your last slide, but what did you anticipate as you were doing the study and creating results that you know, you're kind of handing to the cities, what do you anticipate the city should be doing with this report? from a Vision Zero perspective, pulling it forward. Thank you, and I really appreciate the comments. And I was scribbling away as quickly as possible, and I know we have some staff in the back taking some notes, um, but I appreciate those suggestions, great suggestions. As far as, and the city of San Diego has a Vision Zero plan up and running, doing great work and doing additional supplemental planning to that. The idea for the, the regional Vision Zero action plan is also for other cities that haven't quite got as far, to f first and foremost, get them the eligibility to apply to the competitive funds for safe streets and roads for all. But that's not the only funding source. I mean, this region, uh, statewide, we have the Highway Safety Improvement Program. And in the past, this region has been very competitive. It's been a little bit less as of late. And so if there's opportunities to take the outputs of the regional Vision Zero plan and then pull them into a Highway Safety Improvement plan application, that would be another opportunity looking, and we are always looking for other grants as well. So that's one piece. Once we have the, uh, essentially the, the projects, we go through this prioritization process and we're able to identify kind of project segments, working with local jurisdictions on those. We already know that uh, Safe Streets and Roads for All implementation grants are, are extremely competitive. So, uh, just taking one corridor or one intersection alone and, and applying is going to be super challenging to be successful. So starting to work through kind of how this can be systemic or neighborhood-based, pulling together ideas that from additional data from this plan or other elements to pull those together into a more comprehensive application. Yeah, just ask one follow-up. Um, so is Sandag looking to potentially put together an application that's a collaborative application for Safe Streets for All for capital projects? It's a great question. Don't have an answer for you right now. I think, you know, jurisdictions are the owning agencies. So really we'd look to you to do the application. Sandag, I, speaking I, maybe a bit out of turn, but I think we'd be very supportive of all these projects and we want to see success in this program. Uh, so we want to support where we can. As far as a regional application for implementation, there's a, some challenges we'd have to work through because there's requirements to have kind of a mutual, uh, some agreements about ownership, maintenance, you know, since Sandag is not the owner, we'd have to work through those elements. But I think uh, for ease, it'd probably be local jurisdictions applying, owning agencies applying, and then Sandag supporting in any way it can. Don't, I wanna encourage us to think outside the box of what, um, because we do have models of agreements where Sandag has taken the lead and um, it really can help in um, a jurisdiction to tackle some of those needs. Good, thank you. Thank you, absolutely. Especially for some of us smaller cities that have limited bandwidth when it comes to looking for grants, thank you. Any other comments? Yes. Just two quick comments. Is this being messaged to the tribes as well? Because they're ineligible participant. Um, and also, just really quickly for the HSIP program, the locals also need to have a local road safety plan. Mm -hmm. So maybe this could help feed into it if they don't already have it developed, because that's an eligibility requirement. 
Um, I'm only mentioning that because um, Caltrans will be reaching out when the call for projects for HZIP and ATP come out uh, in the spring, and we will work with you on if you have applications. So if you need uh, have questions on that to reach out to Ryan Odd, he'll be messaging out that coming soon. Thank you for noting that. Uh, so yes, yeah, Sandag has been working with the tribes. We go to the um, tribal working group and we've been there twice to present to them and share this information getting feedback from them and also we have one of our grant partners is the uh luiseno band of, or the Hoya band of luiseno indians thank you thank you uh yes mr ryan um Eddie flores uh city of chula vista um, just uh, thanks for the presentation again. Uh, I, I appreciate uh, Alisa's comments. <laughs> I think uh, funding is very important and joint uh, applications, I think, seem to do much better than uh, the agencies by themselves. Uh, as It's been my experience both uh, while I was in San Diego and also here in Chula Vista. Um, one, one other thing I was going to mention is that um, I think it's great uh, to get funding for planning uh, projects and, and implementation, but I think... Uh, I would ask also Zandag to look into the operations of and maintenance of these facilities. I think, uh, as as we all know, I think most agencies are uh, have a very limited budget for maintenance of their existing facilities. And I think these add-ons, which are great, but uh, it, it's an added uh, I, I wouldn't say burden, but it's an added cost to the to the maintenance budget. So I would I would strongly uh, suggest that we we look at uh, operations and maintenance funds too for these projects. Thanks. Additional comments or questions? Yes. Chair, I um, forgot to introduce myself earlier. I'm Tom Frank, Transportation Director, City Engineer for the City of Carlsbad. And uh, I also support Ms. Mudo's comments. Um, in addition, if you could pull up slide nine, uh, and thank you, Sandag, um, just for those of you who haven't yet, if you look at their data and their modeling that's online, their tools, it's really uh, super interesting and I think helpful to show where <laughs> Uh, demand is and where some of our needed projects are. So I wanted to highlight uh, a historic project that's been in Sandeg's expenditure plan for decades, and it's the uh, Coastal Corridor uh, Rail Trails Project. Um, and uh, you'll see on this that uh, this is the bike uh, safety focus. Um, there's actually a super heavy ridership along the coast highway up in that area. Uh, 2,000 plus riders on weekend days. And so that's one of the roadways that actually has a high percentage of active transportation users. I'm bringing it up for two reasons. One is um, just to highlight that that uh, the rail to trail project has been on the books for decades and, and it seems to have slowed down in the last decade. So I'd like to elevate that where possible. Secondly, I'd like uh, Sandag to just reach out with the individual agencies to make sure we're giving you the, the most current data. Um, I know the bicyclists go through Solana Beach and they're, they're not shown on that as far as the you know heavy green line. I think they, they go all from San Diego through Torrey Pines all the way up through Oceanside and into Camp Pendleton. So want to make sure you're working with all the latest data. Um, same thing on the pedestrian um, network. I noticed like in our city in Carlsbad, um, along the village area where we have a boardwalk, we have over 4,000 pedestrian trips. So 4,000 pedestrians walking along that per day on the weekends, and it just keeps going up. So it just shows the demand um, regarding people want to get outside and they want to walk along the coastline where there's fresh air. Um, with that, I wanted to address the equity issue um, because up in our area, we're not as successful at getting some of the grant funds because you have to demonstrate need and, and equity is an issue. What I wanted to highlight is these are regional assets. The coastline's a regional asset, and we get tons of visitors coming in throughout the county. It's, it's not just local residents that are using these facilities, it's people throughout the county. So it's really um, from an equity standpoint, improving such a beautiful uh, infrastructure asset is beneficial for everybody within the county, including those that are outside of the county that are coming to visit. So I just wanted to highlight those points. Last, I think, Two comments are, uh, one, again, when you look at the heat maps, you're going to see the uh, fatalities and the serious collisions are really focused along the interstate corridors, unfortunately. 
we know those were designed um, decades ago in the 60s and, and really need some improvement. And so if you're looking at where the best use of funds are, look at the fatalities and serious collisions, and you're going to see a, a lot of uh, unfortunate activity around the on and off ramps. And so, again, um, we really need to look at, at improving uh, those, that infrastructure. Um, I can't help but say uh, you have to look at the intersection control, look at what's the safest form of intersection control, uh, addresses all of Sandeg's key issues for efficiency, reduced delay, reduced uh, greenhouse gases, reduced gas use, um, increased safety, increased activity for active transportation, and that is the implementation, uh, as suggested by FHWA and the state, the implementation of roundabouts for intersection control. So um, other than that, that also addresses the childhood obesity issue. Uh, the more functional infrastructure we put in place, it actually, it's like, um, you know, that movie where if you build it, they will come. I think they were referring to a ball field. If you build good walkways and good bikeways where people feel safe and they're away from high-speed vehicles, people will use it. And, and that's what we're seeing along the coastliner. And it's not just the coastline, like Poway has beautiful trails and anywhere that people can get outside and feel safe, they're going to do it. Like people want to want to recreate and they socialize. So th that's my comments, but outstanding effort to date and really appreciate all the data mining. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, council member, I'm sorry, Seabird. Yes, it is. Yes. Thank you. Thank I'm you. from Imperial Beach. I want to tell you, I love those maps because I'm a visual person. And I wanted to tell you, when I saw this one, I was very thrilled because we live along the very southern part of the bay. And when we, I was looking at all the yellow, all the accidents, we have a huge successful, um, it was the railroad track from all around the bay. And I see that there's no accidents and I'm so pleased because that works, the trails, to rails to trails, because you can see where some of the railroad tracks are still there, but they turned it into the bike trail that you can go all around the entire bay. And I'm just thrilled to see in Imperial Beach, there's no accidents where there was a lot of, um, I could see there were a lot of um, um, pedestrian accidents and car accidents. So the having the trails to rails, um, put in it, it will work because it's proof right there but thank you so much thank you any additional comments or questions i would like to thank you all for this very comprehensive report um, i think it's incredibly helpful and um, we will certainly be reaching out as a municipality asking for more detailed information so we can make our our city safer and we could actually get to vision zero um, and i also would like to point out that um uh, it takes political courage for some of us in our cities to actually try to uh, turn four lanes into two uh, because we hear, you know, the world is ending because, you know, it takes us five minutes extra to get to wherever we need to go, but it also makes our city much safer and it decreases the amount of fatalities um, significantly. And I can think of a few intersections in National City where that's the case, where it used to be very dangerous to cross Highland uh, Avenue, which was a four lane, and we turned it into a two lane. And uh, I, I mean, we hear all the time complaints about it from from drivers, but I think the extra few minute wait, it's totally worth individuals' lives. And so um, uh, just putting it out there, I know that we all hear this through our communities and it does take a little political will to, to actually make Vision Zero a reality. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, this was a informational item only. So moving on to item number five, we will now hear from Sandag's uh, grant analyst, Zach Rivera, on the selection criteria for the Specialized Transportation Grant Program Cycle 13, call for projects. All right, good morning, Chair and members of the Mobility Working Group. Um, as the chair alluded, my name is Zach Rivera, and I serve as one of the program managers of the Sandag Specialized Transportation Grant Program, or STGP. As you may recall, I presented to you at your November 2023 meeting to discuss the specialized transportation needs of the region, as well as the STGP goal. 
So I'm returning to you today to provide an overview of the feedback we've heard uh, so far. Seek your input on the criteria we should use in the SDGP cycle 13 call for projects and discuss next steps. So just as a quick refresher, um, here's a recap on the program. So funding for, from the SDGP comes from the Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 program and the Transnet Senior Mini Grant program. The SDGP funds a broad range of specialized transportation services for older adults and individuals with disabilities when fixed route public transit is insufficient, unavailable, or inappropriate. Our program goal is to improve mobility for older adults and individuals with disabilities by delivering effective, equitable, environmentally responsible, and coordinated transportation solutions in our region. Eligible applicants are nonprofit organizations and local governmental agencies, including local jurisdictions. Eligible grant types um, are capital, such as accessible vehicle purchases, mobility management, such as travel training, and operating, such as volunteer driver programs. The Senior Mini Grant Program uh, funds grants countywide, whereas the Section 5310 program administered by SANDAG um, funds grants only in the urbanized areas of San Diego County. The SDGP overall seeks to complement fixed route public transit to strengthen our region's specialized transportation network. So last November, we not only presented to you, but we also engaged the San Diego County Volunteer Driver Coalition, the San Diego Social Equity Working Group, the Council on Access and Mobility, the Age Well San Diego Transportation Team, and the Social, San Diego uh, Social Services Transportation Advisory Council, or STAC. We then held a workshop for stakeholders last month to focus specifically on the evaluation criteria. Throughout the development of the call, we have engaged stakeholders and received input uh, through email, social media, and our webpage. Through these efforts, we received over 100 comments. So here are five themes on the region's specialized transportation needs that have emerged so far. Availability, such as expanded hours and service areas. Flexibility, uh, such as on-demand service as well as service quality, coordination among providers, and affordability. We also asked what, if anything, should be changed to improve the SDGP goal. While some thought no changes were needed, others suggested references to dependability, affordability, and on-demand service be included. So, so far, stakeholders have also suggested that we add affordability, dependability, and efficiency to the selection criteria. So affordability and dependability for riders have emerged as the dominant themes thus far. Additionally, since I presented to you in November, I conducted a literature review and benchmarking analysis where I identified eight comparable regions um, and compared their Section 5310 evaluation criteria with SANDAGs. The analysis revealed that the themes of the SDGP criteria that were used last cycle are consistent with the eight other regions studied. The full analysis is available on the SDGP webpage. So you might be wondering what the criteria was for last cycle. The cycle 12 criteria are available on the SDGP webpage and are also included um, as attachment one of the staff report, and I believe that's page 24 of your agenda packet. Overall, there are eight cri criteria categories for a total of 100 possible points, um, but let me spend a few minutes describing each one. So first we had applicant capacity and experience. This evaluated whether applicants had experience in successfully managing grants and transportation related projects for older adults and individuals with disabilities. It also looked at the financial stability and capacity of applicants. A second, operational slash implementation plan. This measured the level of detail applicants used to describe how would they would be effective 
in providing the proposed service. Next was stewardship of public funds and assets. So for applicants not applying for vehicle funding, this evaluated whether only necessary and reasonable costs were proposed and if sufficient matching funds had been secured. Applicants with vehicle and other equipment projects uh, were evaluated on how well they would use those assets over the grant term, how robust their uh, procedures were to safeguard those assets and the level of matching funds committed to the project. Next was need and equity, and this evaluated whether the service would indeed aid older adults and individuals with disabilities and their specialized transportation needs. It also looked at how the service would benefit those that need it the most, including historically underserved populations. The fifth category was coordination, which addressed how applicants would coordinate with other agencies to address service gaps, avoid duplication, and enhance service delivery. The sixth category was environmental responsibility, which evaluated how the service would promote healthier air and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Next was proposed performance, which varied by grant type, but included uh, measures such as number of hours of service and costs per one-way passenger trip. And then last but not least was performance monitoring, reporting, and outcomes, which evaluated how, how awarded applicants would monitor their service, track client data, measure outcomes, and demonstrate impact. So with all this context in mind, I'd like to pause before we discuss next steps and open it up to you for your thoughts and ideas. Uh, so to guide the discussion, I have three questions for you to consider, and they're also in your agenda packet. Um, do you think these criteria from last cycle help us to identify which applications should receive funding? Of the criteria used last cycle, which do you think are most important? Which do you think are the least important? And what other criteria should we be considering? So I'll pause there and maybe we'll uh, I'll open it up to you to entertain any of your thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Do we have any comments from the members of the public? Thank you. I have one, two public comments. The original draw, please go ahead. You'll be followed by Arun Prem. Yes. So, I mean, this is very important to um, get people, you know, I was paralyzed for eight years uh, and in a wheelchair. So I understand the need for the disabled to be able to get around because it's very, very hard to do. Um, but when we are engaging with a lot of these nonprofits and different things that are providing the service, um, the, you know, there were calls from different members of the public um, a few weeks ago on um, an item, this I particular item at, at just at a different working group or, or committee. And they were saying that, you know, that when they can't always, um, uh, oh my gosh, what's the word, like get into these programs because they don't qualify. Uh, maybe they're not disabled enough or they believe that they can go and get um, transit through the other means. And so I think that we need to be mindful when um, we are having these requirements um, in order for them to be able to get this transportation, that it's not so stringent and strict that they there's not room to um, help them out if they are saying that they can't take the other kinds of transit. And our next public commenter, Arun Prem, please go ahead. You are self-muted. Sorry, good morning. Arun Prem, representing FACT. Uh, I'm a member of MWG, but today speaking as a member of the public. I appreciate the presentation on the criteria, and uh, I think including coordination there for 10 points out of 100 is very important. I appreciate that as well. I just want to caution that uh, coordination is one of those uh, elements in uh, applications, uh, especially uh, competitive ones, where if it's not objectively assessed, uh, if it's not um, supported by solid evidence of actual coordination and uh, demonstration of the benefits, then it can just become uh, free 10 points for applicants who can make claims about coordination, but then don't end up substantiating it or putting in some meaningful efforts or elements in the application. Um, 
So I just want to make sure that this is taken seriously and we have real coordination as a result of this. And that concludes the public comments. Thank you so much. Any comments from working group members? Questions? None? All right, well, thank you so much. This is a discussion item only. Very much appreciate the presentation. Um, moving on to item number six. We will now hear from Sandag's grant program manager, Jenny Russo, on the active transportation program cycle seven, uh, call for projects. Good morning, working group member. So my name is Jenny Russo. I'm the grants program manager here at Sandag, and I oversee all of our competitive grant programs, so Zach's program and some of the other transit ones that you're very familiar with. And I also serve as a program manager for the California Active Transportation Program, or the ATP. So today I'm here to talk to you about the next cycle, which is cycle seven that's gonna be coming out really soon. I appreciate you mentioning that, Roy. So just to start with a little bit of a background, the ATP is a discretionary grant program and it's managed by the California Transportation Commission or the CTC. The program funds projects that encourage active modes of transportation, increase safety for bicyclists and pedestrians, reduce GHG emissions and enhance public health. The program also has a really strong focus on ensuring that disadvantaged communities are represented. There's a lot of different entities that are eligible. So cities, Caltrans, transit agencies, schools, school districts, tribal governments, and also agencies like Sandag are eligible. We've held six cycles of the regional ATP beginning with cycle one in 2014 and concluding with the most recent cycle, cycle six in 2022. The cycle numbers, years, and awarded amounts are shown in this slide, demonstrating an overall investment of over $138 million directly to our region since the program began. Last cycle, a significantly larger amount of funding was available, which was due to the state budget surplus. You'll notice on the pie chart on the right that the majority of the funding, or about 98%, has been awarded to infrastructure projects, and I'm going to discuss the reason for this later in the presentation. So there's over 568 million available in this upcoming cycle. The funding is distributed through three separate competitive processes that are shown on this slide. The ones that you see in green and blue are the ones that are applicable to our region. So first is the statewide component, which distributes 50% of the funding and all applicants across the state compete for funding. Projects that are not funded through the statewide competition then compete again, either in a regional competition or the small urban and rural. For the larger regions in the state like ours, 40% of the funding is distributed through the MPO of that region through that secondary competitive process. The amount of funding available for each region is determined by population, and our region was allocated about 20 million for this upcoming cycle. So this is the timeline for the first component, which is the statewide call. The CTC is expected to adopt the guidelines and fund estimate at their meeting, which is next week, and it'll allow for the release of the statewide call. Applications will be due in mid-June, and the funding recommendations will be announced by the CTC in November with adoption at their December meeting. For the regional competition, we started the process last month with the discussion of the criteria used in the prior cycle with the Sustainable Communities Working Group. The feedback I received from today's discussion will be shared with the Transportation Committee tomorrow, and the combined comments will be used to develop the criteria for the upcoming cycle. The draft call will be brought back to the Transportation Committee and Board of Directors at their meeting in April, and the CTC will be asked to adopt our regional call at its meeting in June. In July, we'll open our regional call and accept applications through September, 
and any project that's not selected for funding through the statewide component will be combined with those additional applications that we receive through the regional call, and that evaluation will, will begin in the fall and conclude next spring. In March, we'll bring the funding recommendations back to the Transportation Committee and Board of Directors, and the CTC will be asked to adopt our regional projects at their meeting next June. There's three different types of eligible projects. They're infrastructure, non-infrastructure, and plans. Infrastructure projects are capital projects, such as new or improved sidewalks, bike infrastructure, and applicants can request funding for any phase of the project, so design, environmental, right-of-way, or construction. For non-infrastructure projects, those are education and encouragement programs that can complement an infrastructure project, or they can be a standalone program. And finally, plans are projects that develop a community-wide bike, pedestrian, safe routes to school, or active transportation plan that encompasses or is predominantly located in a disadvantaged community. I know there's a lot mixed in there. It's important to note that the CTC guidelines limit the amount of funding that can be awarded to plans to 2% of the overall amount available. The CTC guidelines require that all three project types and sizes of projects compete for the same amount of funding, which means there's no set aside amount for each of those types or for the project sizes. The evaluation criteria for each type of project is different, however, and we'll go over those next. So the majority of applications that we receive are for infrastructure projects. So these are the criteria that are used the most frequently. This slide is the criteria that we used last cycle. The changes that we're considering making to the criteria are in criterias three, six, and nine. So safety, public health, and matching funds. For criteria three, this is the area where we're considering the most changes. We're working with our regional planning team, so Sam and his group, to utilize the work that they're doing on the Regional Vision Zero Action Plan and to integrate it into the criteria. So using the maps, using the priority focus areas that they have so that those types of projects receive more emphasis in this criteria. We'll also provide points for projects that have elements that are proven to reduce serious injuries and fatalities, so using like the FHWA guidance, and also looking at NACTO's all ages and abilities. Under criteria six, we could drive this using the California Healthy Places Index score so that points are based on data and provide more consistency across our evaluators. And then for criteria nine, we're interested in reducing the number of points possible in that category since most of our agencies, as we know, don't have matching funds to be able to provide. Other changes that we are going to make, which are driven by comments we've received from the Transportation Committee, is to have a table for each of these criteria that show exactly how those points are going to be awarded. So you will know what is 10 points, 8 points, 6 points, et cetera. This allows for more uniformity across the evaluators and it provides greater transparency back to the applicant to understand how their final score was composed. Mm -hmm. So last month we went to the Sustainable Communities Working Group and their members suggested changes kind of similar to what we've discussed earlier. And they've also asked that we increase the number of points that are in that criteria one, the demand analysis, which are the criteria that looks at characteristics of the project location. So population, density, housing, car ownership, things like that. So this table are the criteria for the non-infrastructure projects, which are education and encouragement. Historically, we have not received a lot of applications in this category, and I believe the reason is typically this work is more impactful when it's combined with a new infrastructure project. Um, so typically we see these types of programs in the ATP, but they're combined with a infrastructure project. So in one application, and when that happens, that infrastructure criteria is used because typically that's the predominant cost that's gonna be driving what is in, included in the application. 
So at this time, we're not proposing any substantive changes in here, but I'm interested if you have any feedback. And then similar to what we're talking about on the infrastructure side, we'll have the same table in this criteria that shows how each of those points will be awarded. And then lastly, this is the criteria for plans. So it's very similar to what was on the previous slide for non-infrastructure. So any changes that we're thinking about making to that one probably would be um, important to include over on here. And as I mentioned earlier, the CTC guidelines limit the amount of funding that can be awarded to plans to 2% of that overall pot. So 2% of the 20 million. And because of this, we typically don't receive a lot of applications in this category. So today's presentation is just to kind of provide you an overview or a refresher of the ATP to talk about some of the changes that we're considering and to request your feedback on the criteria or even process if you have questions about that. Um, you're welcome to contact me through the end of the month with any feedback that you might have. Additionally, we usually get somewhere around 25 to 30 applications in each cycle. So if you know anybody or if you are interested and you're not going to be applying, you're welcome to reach out to me or share your information and share my information in your circles. I'm always looking for evaluators to help um, look at project applications. So this concludes my presentation. I'll turn things back over to the chair. Thank you so much. Do we have any um Comments from the members of the public. Thank you, Chair. I have one public comment through the original draw. Please go ahead. Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, with the major deficit that we face in this state, you know, how this is going to affect um, funding any of these projects, because um, we already know that they have, you know, significantly reduced a bunch of the funding for um, projects that were already taking place in the 2020 in the, in the regional plan not the 2020 region, but, um, and so I'm just wondering, you know, as we're sitting here planning to get all this money, is this going to be something that is taken away as well, um, that's not going to be able to be spent. And so these, um, this infrastructure isn't going to be able to be, um, used. So, um, I think we need to be mindful of that and just the state of our state and, and the deficit. So thank you. Yes. And that concludes the public comments. So, um, you know, with all of this, um, doing two meetings at once, this is really hard to do. My brain can't function. Um, you know, you want to talk about, okay, so you guys are talking about civil rights, which is a little bit interesting because you usurp people's civil rights all the time and, um, you know, don't give them the ability to, um, you know. Your time expired. That concludes the public comments. Thank you. Do we have any committee member comments or questions? Uh, yes. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Janae. That was a very well prepared presentation. I wanna thank you for doing that. Um, also, I mentioned that I know you, uh, having served in your, one of your evaluation committee, I know how you personally feel about this, but uh, what I was hoping to see a little bit more is um, some, um, points may be advantage given to projects that uh, provide benefits to multiple modes of transportation, um, meaning a project that basically uh, uh, addresses many modes of transportation and um, users of the of the mobility uh, component. I think. Most of us are looking for those kind of projects. Some, some of, some of the engineers are very creative addressing them. Um, when the project is developed, ultimately, all, all modes of transportation benefit from it. And I think those are the ones that should be given a little bit higher priority. Uh, maybe if, uh, if this is too late to change the criteria, but when you do your select your evaluation, at least. Uh, the, in, uh, educate them about those type of things that are going to be better for, for all users. So thank you for the presentation. I think it's very well done. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Mo. Ms. Muda. Yes, thank you so much for that presentation, Jenny. I want to echo um, Mo's point. I think that getting the biggest bang for our buck as a city for complete corridors or complete intersections is is a priority, and we'd love to get more funding to do multiple things at once, whether it's ADA, bike, and vehicular 
um, ITS strategies. Um, the other thing that I wanted to see, so it, it is to a disadvantaged community, but we have a lot of areas of getting residents of a disadvantaged community to an amenity in our cities um, or our region. Is that something that can be considered and can you connect those dots with data um, that that is purposeful? And, and I'm thinking of getting people to our beaches and bays, to our significant parks, um, the, the lagoons and, and other areas that um, residents in some of our disadvantaged communities that are maybe more landlocked um, are not getting to easily at this time. Thank you. Additional comments or questions? Yes, Mr. Frank. Um, can you pull up slide number eight? Thank you. Mm -hmm. And thank you for the presentation. And I support um, the other working group members' comments. Um, so in regards to suggested changes, uh, I heard that they were looking to adjust um, three and six, and the last one's matching funds, nine. And so I just wanted to highlight, like, as I mentioned earlier, some of the uh, more affluent communities, bedroom communities aren't very successful at getting grants of late due to the selection criteria and, and totally understand the equity issue. Um, here, I just wanted to highlight that there, right above that, there is a, a line item for benefit to disadvantaged communities of 5%. And so um, what we're seeing is what Ms. Muto explained is, is that some of the landlocked areas, they still want to visit um, some of the regional assets and, and our projects actually do facilitate that. So with the current um, selection criteria, our only hope of, of offsetting or making us more competitive is to actually match funds to put our CIP funds into uh, coming after these grant opportunities. So I would, I'm actually supportive. I think that item number three, that's what this is about, right? It's about safety and the quality of the projects. And when you write in the scope, what the quality of projects is, it can address Ms. Muto and uh, Mo's comments. And so I'm, I'm actually supportive of, of keeping the criteria as is, but just wanted to share those comments overall, very supportive of the program. Um, we, we go after it if we think it's worthwhile and we have a chance of getting it. And uh, thank you. Yes, Mr. Mo. I hardly ever disagree with my colleague, Tom. And, and frankly, this is not a disagreement. I think you, you, you hit the nail right on the head is the fact that the quality is there and it is a subjective um, I guess decision process, which is why I suggested that when when we go through the uh, evaluation process, there, of course there is a there's a panelist selected, and and I think it would be helpful for Sandex staff, uh, Janae specifically, to educate the panel that yes, quality is important, and one of the one of the subjective issues of the of the quality is those projects who actually address multiple modes of transportation. I didn't recommend to specifically have that in the matrix, and I'm happy to see the 33% in there. But the um, the way that if you and I were in the same panel, for example, the way you see a quality project versus I, I see it might be slightly different, which is why I suggested that a little bit of an education would be helpful. Mm -hmm. So I'm 100% I'm in agreement with you. I like the 33%, and I'm not suggesting that you break it down, but but the, but the important thing, so I think we all agree, the projects uh, that are hitting those multiple modes of transportation really are better for the community at large. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was really referring to. Thank you for your comment, Tom. Yes, Mr. Hassan. Thank you for the presentation. On the next slide, uh, I think there's innovation was added, looks like. Is that uh, number six? Uh, I just want to say that that's always a tricky uh, criteria to uh, to describe. Uh, just having written grant applications and reviewed them myself, and um, there's really a lot of times there's not a whole lot to innovate. You know, when you're doing an active transportation infrastructure project, and I think that just adds to kind of the subjectivity of the ATP program. Uh, I'm happy to see you know some of the um, 
more, I, I guess, objective criteria that you can quantify. I, I, my input would be not to include that, but I, you know, I'm not sure what the kind of the reasoning behind it that it was added. Can I just clarify? There's just been mention of benefits to different modes, but you didn't specify what modes. Just to be clear, like because just your comment. That's all. I'm sorry. Are you asking me to? Yeah, I just, I just. So, so for because example, it's not uh, applicable for not uh, for vehicles. So are you meaning bicycling and? Absolutely. Okay, I so, just want to so be clear. What sorry. I really meant was the project that deals with ADA requirement, pedestrian requirement, bicyclists, and at the same time vehicles, adding more parking, for example, and or make the corridor easier for for even vehicles. I think that project would really deserves a little bit of attention. But for ATP, just... it's not eligible for the vehicle pieces. So I guess that's the piece that I just wanted to clarify for this program. That's all. I'm just... Well, that, no, I wasn't about, talking about the non-infrastructure. I was talking about the infrastructure project. Yeah, the, the, non, well, it, the program, the ATP program is for non-motorized improvements. So that's why I was just trying to clarify because if the collect period doesn't match what the program needs, that's all I was trying to but... Yeah, we just have to be careful when yeah. we put in things outside of non-motorized. It has to primarily benefit bicyclists and pedestrian it doesn't mean you can't have any of it but right. we have to watch what ctc allows for i appreciate the, the comment Thank yeah you. you just don't want to make the project not competitive for the program sure. sure yes um kind of going along with what mo and frank were saying earlier on that slide number eight um for the where is my numbers are there uh, for that safety and quality of projects Maybe quality, we're adding the word benefit, possibly could be more um, clear on, on what can be done with that and how it would benefit a community. Because I'm also, I, I've had um, concerns with, um, not concerns, but, you know, the disadvantaged communities where we don't, we don't end up meeting that. And so that hinders us. But then if we we can bridge the communities by putting something in a non-disadvantaged community and trying to work that language into a grant and stuff like that. So I'm just thinking maybe the word um, for number three, adding it or changing out quality is like benefit to the community as a whole. Thank you. Additional comments, questions? No? Thank you so much for the very good presentation. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Uh, this was a discussion item only. And uh, so we will be adjourning. Our next uh, mobility working group meeting is scheduled for Thursday, May 9th, 2024 at 9.30 a.m. And we are adjourning at 11.15. Thank you so much. <laughs>